Welcome into another episode of the Crimson Corner. I am your host, Michelle Bodkin, Utah Utes insider for kslsports.com. And we are here counting down some of the greatest teams in Utah football history. We've already done the 1994 team and the 2008 team. So if you haven't listened in on those, go check them out now. However, today, yes, a little out of order, but it's fine. It's just what we do here. We are checking in with the 2004 season. Now, this was a year that I feel like really set the stage for how things have kind of gone in very recent history. This, This is like the gasoline as far as every everything else that has happened since then uh this team came out of nowhere I don't think anyone ever expected this team to do what it did and it absolutely shifted the entire paradigm of what we know of college football today in order to talk about the 2004 season I have brought in special guest former wide receiver Paris Warren Paris how are you doing I'm doing just fine great uh, you know, I let's get started. Let's just talk about, you know, the expectations going into that 2004 season. Were you guys on anybody's radar? Uh, we always got overlooked. <clears throat> so after our first year, we won 10 games. So everybody like, if we won 10 games this year and we just started, just imagine what we'll do <laughs> next year after already having a year under our belt. Now. Most of these teams, and, I, and I've and i heard this from other people that you've played with in the past, uh, it feels like you guys had a pretty good idea that this team would be good. Did you realize, though, that it would be as special as it ended up being? Uh, I, I would say probably by week three, we already knew the ball was already rolling. So it just a matter of, it didn't matter who we was playing. We were going to roll over them. And so, you know, going into that season, what were you guys doing maybe a little bit differently than you had done in the past uh, as far as preparation, you know, making sure that you were doing all the things that you needed to do in order to, at the very least, have a respectable season? Well, it all started with summer workouts. We all came to, a lot of us didn't even go home for summer vacation. We all stayed. So that was like the turning point for our our team. And this got the team to be closer to each other. And we already knew we had players because, you know, everybody, anybody that, that's beaten us, they see they, they didn't just beat us. It was like with a walkthrough. They had to work for it. I think one of the things that was particularly different about this 2004 team uh, and really the very short Urban Meyer era was that offense – really kind of stepped up it became it became good uh Utah was able to actually put points up some of the earlier seasons you know really kind of relied on defense and and then kind of moving into the Pac-12 era it shifted back to really relying on defense again you know what what made Utah's offense in 2004 so special we had the players. We had the right guys. We had a good system. And really, pretty much, we all believed in each other. So, with that being said, I mean, we put the work in. So, playing was easy, honestly. The hard work came with preparation, getting getting ready for the season. That was probably the hardest for us was getting ready. But other than that, the offense, we already knew Utah's always been known for having a stout defense. So, we kind of – outshined them in 04. A big part of that shining for for the offense was, of course, quarterback Alex Smith. Uh, He got thrown into playtime the season before. What kind of growth had you guys seen from Alex from 2003 to 2004? That was a full turnaround because he was a he was a young guy. You know, he was was a backup as well. And then when Brad Elliott went down the uh, Texas A&M game, he came in, I think the next game was against San Diego State. And for his first start like that, like, we had to take our hat off to him. He took a beating that game, and we still scored almost 60 points. 
So a lot of respect for him. And from that day forward, like, it was on. He he knew he he knew how to game manage the game and get the ball to his guys. You and Steve Savoy were kind of the anchors of that wide receiver group, uh, the people that he was really throwing the ball to. Uh, you know, talk talk about that wide receiver room and and some of the things that you guys were doing a little bit differently than maybe what Utah fans were used to from the past. Oh, we had our coach, Billy Gonzalez. <laughs> he was on our tail every day. So uh, we had to do a lot of things differently than normal receivers would do, like, like blocking. A lot of receivers don't block. If we didn't block, you're not playing. It was just simple. So we kind of took pride in that. And me and Savoy, as me being the older guy, I kind of gathered the troops up, like, you know, because I transferred from Oregon. So I was like, hey, man, this is my last go around. We got we to gotta go all in. And they all bought into it. You also had a phenomenal running back in Quentin Ganther. You know, talk about him as a player and and how he kind of helped elevate that Utah offense. Uh, he was an X factor because when he came from junior college, I hosted him because you know we both from Northern Cali, so I kind of hosted him. I'm like, hey man, you might want to, might want to hop on this ship because this ball rolling. And you know, he signed that day. And then him and Marty Johnson, that was, that's a cold combination to have back there. So they could, they really couldn't stop them. And then, of course, on the defensive side of the ball, you guys had some players as well. Morgan Scally, Steve Tate. You know, talk about especially that defensive backfield. It was really good. Oh, we battled with them every day. <laughs> every every day. They, they were tired of us because we kicked their tail every day. Coach Witt was mad all the time, but it worked out. You know, they when they came to game time, they did, nobody offense was like ours. So it kind of it worked both ways. And their defense, our defense was no pushover either. It wasn't easy, but we know them every day. We put you battle against them every day, so you kind of know the their weaknesses. So it worked out. And then, of course, we'd also be remiss if we didn't talk about kind of an all-purpose player for Utah and Eric Weddle uh, could really be put anywhere on the field, any position, and he was successful. What was it like watching this guy just kind of get plugged into it anywhere and and have success? When you're a baller, hey, you, there's no way you could put a baller, keep a baller like that on the sideline. You just got to put him in there and let him, let him do what he do. And him being a young guy, it was kind of funny because it's like, He's a California guy too, so we already know how we play football a little bit different than a lot of other people, a lot of other states. So Weddle, you know, he's been our guy, man. He, we kind of rolled his tail a little bit, made him step his game up. But hey, you see what happened on game day? Urban Meyer, you know, is a bit of a controversial character. On one hand, he gets results. On the other hand, you know, he. He can be hard to deal with. I think that's just about any college football coach in a lot of ways. But what was it that Urban kind of brought to Utah to make this whole thing go and really push you guys to the greatness that you ultimately ended up achieving? Well, his system works. He came with a firm structure that uh, it was simple. Either you buy in or transfer. You know, it was no in between. So what he said goes, and hey, look what happened. Utah never won 10 games. We did that. Then we turned around and win 12 games, back to back. And it's like, see, if you just buy in and, you know, get the, got the right guys on your team, you can win anywhere. His defensive coordinator, of course, is Kyle Whittingham, who is now the head coach. You know, talk about Kyle back in those days and and what he was like then versus I know you came back and you were actually a graduate assistant under Kyle. Uh, you know, what he was like as a head coach. Oh, totally different. Totally different. I think he doesn't yell as much as he did back when he was on as a coordinator. But, uh, you know, Coach Wood is my guy, man. He always – open the doors for us and let us let us do our thing. And he would tell us, like, hey, keep keep kicking our tail. You know what I mean? We need to get better. So stuff like that, he would, would say to, to the receivers because he knows it's a battle every day. You know, you don't want to be on the losing end every day because you got to watch film. 
when was it that you guys started actually talking about running the table and going undefeated? At what point in the season did that start occurring? Uh, I think that was after the um, Liberty Bowl. After we played the Liberty Bowl, and we knew we had a lot of guys coming back. So we knew, and uh, we got we, all our positions were filled in, especially on offense. So we already knew what was going to come the next year, especially after spending a year of learning an offense that you'd never ran before. So it was kind of hard the first year. But the second year, it's like, you know, everything ran smoothly. And at what point did did you guys kind of start thinking that you could really shake the system up? I, this was a system that was just designed specifically to keep a school and a team like you guys out. And nobody had ever broken through that uh, since it was established. You were the first to do that. Like I said, we felt we always was underrated. I, like I transferred from Oregon, so for me to leave a program like that to come to Utah, you know, everybody would think that was a step down. In my eyes, it wasn't because when we played or uh, Utah played Oregon in, in Eugene, Utah was kind of giving it to us. And it's like, man, they, they got some guys over there. So then when I transferred, it was like, okay, I knew, I knew this team and I got a chance to get back at working. So I was going no other place but Utah. I, I mean, talk about that a little bit because you were at a place like Oregon. Oregon, you know, especially in recent years has been quite revered uh, and has mm-hmm. put out some really, really good teams. And you run into this, this little team from Salt Lake that barely anyone ever hears about. And you walk away impressed by them. What what exactly was it about Utah that impressed you while you were at Oregon? It started with the coach, Coach McBride. You know, I love that guy, man. That was Utah wouldn't be where it's at today without Coach Ron McBride. I'm gonna say that right now. And he brought a lot of guys, and a lot of guys came to Utah for McBride. You know what I'm saying? Because we wasn't, I wasn't ever my recruit, Savoy. None of us. We were none of. We were already there. We were there before he got there. So that team was already set. They had players and they always got overlooked. I don't understand why, but I feel like the offensive side wasn't holding up their end of the bargain back in the day. It was just always the defense. You guys finally learn, you know, you've busted the BCS. Uh, you have college game day there to witness, you know, this this little piece of history that's been made. What's going through your guys' minds at that point in time during that big BYU game? For me, it was like deja vu because I already been through game day with Oregon. And that's that was so that's an experience you never forget. So as we hear we about to have game day in Salt Lake, I'm telling the guys like, man, it's about to get serious around here. And then you as it as the week go on, you see them coming in. I only got more excited to play this game because you know BYU. I only got two got to play them twice, and them was probably the two loudest games I ever been in. And that game is the funnest game on the schedule. And so you know, you win this game. You, did you know instantly that you guys were going to get into a New Year's Six bowl game in one of those uh, PCS? bowl games or was it a bit of a wait and see thing at that point yeah, i'm sorry i didn't hear you what you say oh no worries uh you know you guys beat byu you go undefeated you run the table it, did were you guys confident at that point that you were going to get into one of those bcs bowl games or was it still a little bit of a wait and oh see? yeah I feel like we did enough work. We put, we scored enough points, and we show every TV game, national TV game, we won. So I feel like we did what we we did enough to show the world that. We did. Sorry about that. You're good. We we did enough. We did enough to uh, show the nation that we deserve to play on that stage. And so. You know, you get the invite to the Fiesta Bowl. You get paired up against Pittsburgh. 
Pittsburgh's not exactly the best team. There, there was some talk and some noise about people were a little bit afraid to pair Little Utah with one of those bigger type teams in the event that you could embarrass them. Uh, you know, talk about getting that matchup with Pittsburgh and, and what was going on through your guys' minds. For us, we felt like, again, that was a disrespect to us. Like, if you go and face up against Pittsburgh after we run the table, like, we wanted to play like USC, mm -hmm. Auburn. We felt like we were going that level. Because when you play it, when you, as you know, football, you got to play all three phases, offense, defense, and special teams. And our special team was, was pretty high. I felt like we would have did enough on special teams to win that game. And I don't think their defense could have stopped our offense at all. So you get into this game, and I mean, it's not close. It's 35 to 7. Game's pretty well decided, you know, by halftime. I, it, and I've talked yeah. about this a little bit. Like, I didn't even see the end of the game because I was like, well, I mean, you know, this is, this is pretty well over. You know, looking forward four years, you get, you watch Utah in 2008, again, run the table, do it for a second time and get paired up with Alabama. What's going right. through your mind? I'm like, oh, here we go. I'm like, I'm like, let's go. I'm rooting for them guys so bad to beat Alabama because I'm so tired of hearing about Alabama. Like, there's good players everywhere, not just Alabama. So when they beat them, oh, I was so, I was pumped. <laughs> like, I was, I was, I was overly pumped when they beat them because now it's like, okay, this team can get beat. And they had a they had a they had a nice team that year too. Utah beats Alabama, you know, they do they do the 12 and 0, 13 and 0 thing, you know, two two times in a four year span, it results in a Pac 12 invite. That's Are weird. you sitting there thinking, you know, Yes, like like this this is what we worked for, or was it surprising? Like what what was kind of going on there looking back at that? I was always I was surprised that they went to the Pac 12, but I was happy at the same time because it's like, okay, here go a bigger stage to play on. And with that stage, it comes better recruits. You know what I'm saying? More exposure to the program. So I feel like with them two seasons being undefeated, we finally Put the Utah on the program on the map as a real legitimate football program. Utah gets into the Pac-12, and you know I feel like the initial reaction was always, "Well, Utah is going to be one of the doormats in in this conference," and they go in that very first year and have a shot at potentially taking you know the South Crown potentially playing in the very first Pac-12 championship game, come up a field goal short on that. Uh, you know, were you kind of sitting there going like, yeah, like obviously Utah's going to come to play or, or was there some surprise at how quickly Utah actually started competing in that league? I already knew they were going to compete because of the program of, of, of what they teach in there. You know, it's either everybody gets the same opportunity to work hard. You know what I'm saying? Utah, we really take advantage of it. And we don't underestimate nobody, but we love when they underestimate us because then they find out the hard way. You you actually have had an opportunity fairly recently to come back and experience the program as a Pac-12 school, as a grad assistant coach. You know, what was that experience like for you? Kind of seeing the difference between what you had back in 2004 versus what you had <laughs> when you were there. Oh, 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 you know, I was a little jelly when I got back, like, like, oh, my God, they got everything we didn't have. What? I was I was excited and jealous at the same time, but I had fun, you know. I worked out again like, like I was a player, you know, coaching. I was out there. I even put my practice full gear with them one practice. <laughs> so I, I had a ball, you know, teaching them. They, I feel like they brought years back to my life, man being around them guys for them couple seasons. I, and remind me what year again you were there grad assisting? Uh, 15 and 16. Okay, that's kind of what I thought. That's kind of what yeah. I remembered. Yeah. I, I mean, 
those were some really good teams too. That, that really kind of felt like a time when Utah was starting to really figure out who they were in the Pac-12. All right. Hey, they had a couple guys. It started with my cousin, Devontae Booker. So, you know, they had, they had some players there. I just don't understand why the offense didn't hold up their end of the bargain with all of that talent they had on, the, on that offense. Side. But, you know, best thing about it, man, is to turn around and look where they're at today. They got some studs over there still. So, hey, I'm excited for them this year. Let's talk about last year because Utah has always been a team that seems to defy the odds. And each time it feels like it gets a little more unbelievable than the last time. And I, I said it in 2008. I remember this so specifically. I don't know how Utah ever tops this. And then 2021 happened and it's like, holy cow, like you couldn't write a better script. What, what was your impression of that team and how they kind of rallied in order to get their first Pac-12 title and their first Rose Bowl appearance? Hey, first off, shout out to them two young players that passed away. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's unfortunate and praying for their families. But with that being said, I mean, you have no choice but to play like that. After you lose two of your players, you know what I mean? There's, there's only one way after that, honestly. After seeing somebody, something like that happen to two guys you go to battle with, that kind of puts a dent in you. So it kind of, that when something like that happens, it, trust me, it, there's no other way but to go that way. And I wasn't surprised on how they, their season turned out because of that. And talk about how that speaks to the brotherhood that Utah's really created. I, you know, those 94 guys are really tight and close. They know a whole bunch of people that they never played with. You guys are very tight and close. You guys know a bunch of people and are friends with, you know, players that you never played with. Uh, and, and how that maybe helped guide them through a really difficult situation that other teams wouldn't get through so well. Yeah, only, I guess, unfortunate, but only a team that goes through that type of type of uh, ordeal will only be able to, ex- to know what it's like. You, It's hard to explain because the brotherhood is so tight. You don't want to see that happening. No football player, even if it's another team. No, you don't want to see that. But when it happens, you know, you, you have to move forward and you can't, you can't just keep going in that same direction. You have to make a change somewhere. And talk about, you know, Kyle Whittingham's leadership, because again, I just don't know. I don't know if anyone else could have been so successful under those circumstances. It, it all starts, like I said, at the top from the head coach down. Whatever he's preaching to those guys, they, they bought into it and it works. You know, you might not like it as a player. I mean, I've been on both sides. You know, you don't like the coach. You got to do all this stuff. And then do this, it's like, hey, but it's a part of the process. That's why I love football. You got to respect the process. I feel like finally, and it's still not perfect, but finally Utah is starting to be talked about and get some of the respect that they have probably deserved for a long time now, at least for 20 years, if not longer than that. You know, going into this season, seeing what this team – could potentially accomplish, you know, what sen- kind of sense of pride does that give you as a guy that really kind of helped build the foundation to get to this point? I'm very prideful. <clears throat> we rep Utah. <laughs> we rep it. Even though we're not playing, we really rep it. We talk smack. But it's a pride thing. You know, you, you want to see your program do good, even after you leave. I mean, that's why I always go back every year and go to one or two games so I can see the faces of the new guys so they can know, hey, I'm one of the older guys that helped build this thing up, keep this thing going, man. I, finally, you know, looking back on that 2004 team and just where the program and the athletic department has launched since that point, 
you know, what do you hope people remember about your time there, the 2004 team's time there, you know, going forward in history? Hey, I just hope we was able to give you guys a show you all haven't seen before. Because for us, hey, they made it. They made it loud. And that helped us out a whole lot. It wasn't nothing like the must and that 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 fan, that fan base. Like Utah is really a state that takes care of their people. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't matter the race or anything. Like them were some of the nicest people I ever involved myself with ever. So I, I just I, that's always been my second home. So that's why I always go back, always. Well, there you have it. You've been listening to Paris Warren talk about the 2004 season. Paris, I really appreciate appreciate you jumping on and just giving a little bit of insight as to what happened back when you were playing and maybe how that translates to what we're seeing with Utah now. Man, I appreciate you, Michelle, so much for bringing me on. Anytime you need me, give me a buzz. <laughs> Will do. All, All right, right, guys. That is another episode of the Crimson Corner Stay tuned. We have one more countdown. Uh, Of course, we're going to have to talk about the 2021 football team uh, that really is going to probably be a big piece of what happens this year. Uh, I feel like it's a building block to that. We're going to talk to someone that knows a thing or two about what happened that year. Thanks again for listening. As always, I'm Michelle Bodkin signing off. You have been listening to Crimson Corner and go Utes.